We're live? Okay, we're live. Hello, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to the London Buddhist Centre Shrine Room uh, with me, Kshanti Kara. And uh, to one side of me, you can see Sabuti. Um, so we'll just give everyone a bit of chance to arrive. Um, we'll start at seven, so in a few minutes. Um, so a few more people will join us probably. Uh, there's been lots of people watching these um, each evening, actually. It's been, uh, yeah, really exciting. And so welcome back if you've been tuning in to these interviews with Sabuti each day. Um, what I'm gonna do now is change my screen here to see if people are saying hello. Actually, I can't do that. So you'll need to tell me a few things, the people behind the camera. Um, I can see it there now, yeah. So uh, we've got various people saying hello in the chat. So do say hello in there. You might get a special mention. So we've got Amy saying hello again from Berlin. Oh, good. Yeah, Sophie from Haringey. Good, uh, yeah. We've got uh, Kevin from his man cave in Leon C. Oh, wow. <laughs> it's pretty good, which doesn't look half as grand as your cave, Sabuti. No. Uh, special mention. <laughs> we've got... Um, who else have we got? We've got uh, Viria Bodhi from Sweden. Oh, Viria Bodhi, hello. Nice, uh, to, nice to know that you're there. And, oh yeah, from the retreat center there. Oh, um, yeah. We've got Dee from Kentish, Chat, Kentish Town. Nina, who each evening seems to have got a special mention from NYC. Oh, right, yes. NYC is just inherently well worthy cool. of a special mention. Yes. Yeah, inherently cool. Um, yeah. And we've got, who else have we got? We've got Sophia from somewhere, but it's now moved on my screen. Rob from Cardiff. Sophia from- Borida, Rob. Borida. Borida, you're well speaking. <laughs> Very good. Um, or Prananda uh, rather, yeah. Todd from Clapham. Mm -hmm. Loads of people, Paul from Brighton. Someone from Bow. Someone else from Wales, from Cardigan. Ah, Karadigion. Ah, we've got uh, Liz from Tasmania in Australia. Oh, right. That's exciting. So from Australia. Um, we've got Sarvajit and Jane from Cambridge. Hello, oh. Sarvajit. Yes, yes. Uh, Salvador from Mexico. Did you meet oh. Salvador when he was at Adestan for a bit? Yes, yes. Meet him. Uh, Buen venido. And yeah, you're very good at the um, greeting, Sabuti. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite impressed. Um, another person from Australia, Kay. Uh, yeah. Is oh, that James's cool. mother? Greetings to James's mother. Hmm. Yeah, you're right, Kay Brody. No, James. Yes. Is. And we've got Harvey from Deptford. Who I think we often call Tall Harvey around here. Uh, I don't know whether he knows that, but he does now. Um, Michael from Ireland. So yeah, we've got lots of people uh, tuning Very in. Good. Lots yeah. of people tuning in um, for this evening. And it's gone seven o'clock now. Um, okay. So why don't we begin? Um, so yeah, welcome again to everyone who's uh, joined us uh, here on the London Buddhist Centre's YouTube channel. Uh, my name's Kishanti Kara and I'm sitting here in the main shrine room. Uh, and tonight I'm going to be interviewing Sabuti, who I'll introduce in a second. Um, and the sort of... Uh, well, the way the evening will work is um, I'll introduce Sabuti. Sabuti will lead us in a short meditation so that we can arrive here together. And then uh, I'm going to be interviewing Sabuti on uh, spiritual receptivity. There'll be a break about quarter to eight uh, and a chance to ask questions uh, for about 20 minutes uh, at the end. So this week, Sabuti is visiting as our president, as the London Buddhist Centre's president, of which when I was visiting, listening, <laughs> visiting yeah, visiting in kind of cyberspace, yeah. uh, the London Buddhist Centre, although usually, Sabuti, you'd visit the London Buddhist Centre, what, for a week, two weeks in a year, split? Yeah, twi half? Twice a year, for, a, for a, a, a week to 10 days each time. And I think you've been the president of the London Buddhist Centre for 30 years or maybe more. Yes. A long time. <laughs> um, and uh, you're here this week, um, well, you're leading meditations in the morning, uh, which I'm sure many people have been joining in with, and in the evening uh, uh, being interviewed. And in both of those sessions, you're exploring uh, these five aspects of the Dharma life, uh, mm -hmm. the five essentials, I think we've called it in this series. Mm -hmm. So on Monday, you uh, had an, uh, an interview, a chat with Dhanu Tar on integration. Uh, last night with Tanya Manus on positive emotion, and tonight uh, we'll talk about uh, 
spiritual receptivity. Mm. I'm really, really pleased to have you here, Sabuti, uh, or, you know, here, as it were, uh, or to be looking at you on the screen. Um, you're such a boon to the London Buddhist Centre. Um, uh, such a good president, I think, actually. The idea of the president model, from what I understand, is to have uh, someone, I think ideally a wise person, ideally an experienced person, maybe even an older person, I guess. Uh, that's often how you get wise and experienced. At, at least I, I tick that box, the you old bit. That's for sure. And, uh, well, you, you really care about the London Buddhist Centre and um, you're quite intimately associated with it, both in terms of all the work you did to found it, I know with a team, but... Uh, you know, a lot of energy from you, um, but also from all of that time. So that's just over 40 years, isn't it, of um, caring for the London Buddhist Centre, which is um, a complicated web of relationships and uh, infrastructure and finances and all sorts. Uh, you know, it's a big worldly charity and it's a big spiritual community. Uh, and you really care for those things. Um, so I think it's a real boon to have you uh, visiting us uh, in this kind of cyberspace. And I'm really pleased um, you were up for it. Um, you could have sort of decided to sort of chill out as it were, or um, uh, just sit maybe in a more spiritual receptivity kind of way uh, in your abode in Wales. But I'm really pleased that you're up for engaging like this online. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to um, interviewing you uh, and seeing where we go. Um, <laughs> But maybe for now, I'll hand over to you to um, well, say hello and to lead us in a short meditation. Right. OK. Well, from me, greetings to everybody. I'm, I'm very happy indeed to be participating in these really rather interesting events. I never know what's going to happen. And each evening is a different person interviewing me. And of course, that produces different, uh, a different dynamic. Mm -hmm. uh, I should just warn you, I, I live in Wales and we are uh, under a, an amber, a, a, a yellow a weather warning. Ah. So there the may be very heavy rain at some point. There was a very heavy uh, hailstorm this morning during the, the meditation. I couldn't hear myself talk. I don't know whether anybody else could hear me. But if it gets very loud, um, above my head is a tin roof. So uh, it may get very <laughs> loud. We'll do our best anyway. <laughs> Uh, um, but yes, it's wonderful to be in the, the LBC Shrine Room, albeit uh, only via a camera. Mm. Uh, I had so much to do with establishing that Shrine Room, and uh, I know so many stories about every detail of, of what I can see right now. I remember the, the Rupa being brought up through the floor uh, oh, wow. with great difficulty uh, just the morning of the, uh, the day before the opening ceremony and it being uh, gold leafed overnight. So I can tell you so many stories, but that's not yeah. what we're here for. <laughs> I'm interested, yeah. <laughs> so uh, the, uh, the, the, the format that we've been having is that we just sit for a little while uh, in order to all come present. Uh, people have come from wherever they've come from, and no doubt... Uh, uh, other events are taking place in your life. So it's a good opportunity just to arrive and sit. And uh, since our theme is uh, spiritual receptivity and the practice that corresponds to spiritual receptivity is just sitting, that's what we'll do. We'll just sit. Mm -hmm. So uh, please make yourself a little comfortable. If you want to, you can close your eyes just to... Uh, isolate yourself from the, the senses a little. And just sit. See what's going on inside you. See how you feel to begin with. What's your emotional state, your mental, your mood?
if thoughts arise or images, just observe them, let them go. Just sit. So when you're ready, just relax your posture, open your eyes, and 
and bring yourself into the LBC Shrine Room and uh, I will put myself at the mercy of Shantikara. At the mercy of. Thank you very much for that, Sabuti. Um, yeah, good way to arrive. Easy to get overexcited, at least for me. I can turn into a bit of a um, children's TV presenter with these uh, online things. <laughs> um, but yeah, as I was saying, Sabuti, I'm really pleased to be um, interviewing you, and particularly uh, on this topic. Um, when I uh, asked for ordinations about five years ago, maybe just over, uh, I um, asked for ordination to Yana Varcha, so you ask an order member, and um, he was very happy, and then very promptly the next day emailed me a set of talks that I think you'd recently given at Pamaloka on the five aspects of Dharma life and said, uh, sort of said something like, since you're interested in ordination, this is what you're signing up to. Right. These talks are brilliant. And they had a very, very strong effect on me. Um, so I think you're a really good person to be talking about them. Yeah, these themes, and you've done so many times before. Yeah. I, I wondered if before we started talking about spiritual receptivity, which is our theme this evening, um, you could give something of a recap, um, or, or at least a little um, description of oh. integration and positive emotion, which we've talked about over the last few evenings, just because I think it will help us to be able to come back sure. to them as we talk. So I wonder if you could just do a yeah. quick summary of yes. the first few pages. Yes, yes. So... Briefly, to put things in context, these five aspects are, uh, as it were, horizontally uh, arranged. So they're all aspects that you need to develop, but they also have a sequential character. Mm. So that in the course of your spiritual life, you need to develop integration and on that basis, positive emotion and on that basis, uh, receptivity, spiritual death and spiritual rebirth. But we're dealing with them mainly in the evenings in terms of uh, their horizontal arrangement. Mm. Uh, but the, 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 uh, the, the sequential character is also inevitable. Uh, so integration is the drawing together of all the energies of your being, of your mind, into a single harmonious whole mm. so that you're able to uh, move forwards uh, in, in, uh, in the Dhamma. And uh, that integration ultimately uh, amounts to, to integration with reality itself mm. at its highest possible level. But in the initial, initial stages, it's simply making sure that you've got a single uh, unified um, uh, self-experience mm. and uh, mindfulness. Positive emotion is pretty much what it says on the label. Uh, it's uh, it, it's really more skillful skillful uh, intentions. It's mm. desires that are for the benefit of self and others, mm. and uh, it's best represented by the, uh, the 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 experience of Maitri Metta, uh, mm. which we explore in Metta Bhavana. So here we're we're taking the energy that we're unifying and we're uh, putting it to a more and more constructive direction, as it were. Mm -hmm. We're trying to develop very positive uh, intentions. Uh, we stressed yesterday that positive intentions does not mean ha being happy. Mm. <laughs> uh, curiously, if you're, if you're not happy, you can still have positive emotion. That is, you can have positive intentions. Uh, and, but on the other hand, of course, under the law of karma, positive intentions will breed uh, happiness. Mm. So that then brings us to spiritual receptivity, which we don't mm. yet know what it is. We not <laughs> about that yet. And, and one, one, the London Buddhist Centre, we're calling this the essentials, aren't we? That's oh. our mm. title. I wonder if you'd say something, we'll get on to spiritual receptivity, but maybe about this set, are, are they essential to everyone or just Buddhists? Or in what way are these things that we're talking about these evenings essential? Yes, of, of course, you can cut the cake in many different ways. And uh, every time you cut it, everything's essential. <laughs> but um, uh, I, I think this is a, a pretty good analysis of the care key areas of what is a... Uh, a decent human life mm. and a decent human life is a, a human life in which one is growing mm. 
mm. in which one is becoming more than was was before. Mm. So these are the, the 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 five areas in which that growth will be uh, taking place, and you can't privilege one over another. Mm. Maybe to begin with, you need to focus more on integration and then on positive emotion, but ultimately all five must be developed equally. Uh, mm. And uh, if if you do not, then uh, your spiritual life will be uh, lopsided and eventually will collapse in one way or another. Uh, mm. And uh, so, yes, they are essential ingredients, mm. even if you could find another set of mm. seven or ten or whatever that yeah. might say the same thing. These do a pretty good job in, in very understandable terms, mm. at least initially. Mm. And um, we'll be looking at spiritual receptivity this evening, but the other ones that we'll explore are spiritual death and spiritual rebirth, aren't they? Yes, yeah. Yeah. those are less obvious, of course. So they don't uh, say immediately what they mean unless you've already studied them. Yeah, yeah. we'll come back to them in the further evenings. Yeah. Um, so moving to spiritual receptivity, I wonder if you could, um, well, just start by saying, um, you know, what spiritual receptivity is. Obviously, we'll talk about that all evening. But um, sure. as a sort of starting point, you've talked about, um, you know, kind of making efforts. Um, yes. Stages of integration, bringing yes. yourself together as a whole, yeah. moving that whole positively forward. Mm. Uh, and then, and now we're kind of, now there's this receptive element, this right. receptive yeah. element. Would you say something about yeah. what that means and how it, what, or maybe also why that's next in this sequential yes. model? Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it, uh, when, when we begin our spiritual lives, we need to make quite a bit of effort, as you've already pointed out, because we're disintegrated and we're often not especially positive, uh, to put it mildly. Uh, <laughs> and we need to do quite a lot of conscious work that will not just happen by itself. Mm. But ultimately, uh, in through spiritual life, to use that term, we're connecting with something that goes beyond ourselves. Uh, we're connecting with reality itself and that cannot be willed mm. uh, it, we cannot force it as it were uh, mm. we have to open ourselves to it mm. so now we're coming on to spiritual re receptivity we're learning to open ourselves to that which transcends ourselves uh, mm. there you are then a very small yeah. neat uh, definition yeah learning to open up to that which transcends ourselves yes yeah 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 Hmm. Well, and um, the one I was reading your um, talk and listening to the talk you gave at Padma Local sure. on this topic a few years ago, and yeah. uh, I was really struck by the amount of film recommendations in it, um, which got <laughs> me, which got me thinking about Yana Barcher and Mike Bander, who I think see themselves as sort of disciples of yours, and they're yeah. forever talking about film recommendations right. in in their shrine room, and. Um, yeah. I wondered if you could say something about why you're talking about film recommendations in, in a month's spiritual receptivity. It doesn't quite, I don't know, it, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Yeah, but it, yeah could you well, say something about that? Yes, I, th I think that uh, what I was probably getting at, and, and I don't remember the talk very well, mm -hmm. but I think what I was getting at was that when you watch a really good film, a film that's got some uh, uh, a, a significant aesthetic quality, there's a response in you to it, mm. uh, and uh, it's not a it's not a worked out response. Mm. Uh, there's certain kinds of films that you really don't like, where th there's sort of whodunits, uh -huh. um, where you're you're always trying to work out, oh, it's it, that's what's going on. This is what happened. Mm. Uh, okay, that's got its own uh, 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 um, entertainment value, mm. but a, a really good film is appealing to an aesthetic faculty within you. Mm. your capacity to respond to what comes from a, 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 a higher dimension. Mm. In, in film, it's not necessarily a transcendental dimension, although sometimes they mm. seem to touch on that. Mm. But uh, film is, I think, the, the, the main medium of our times, the main aesthetic medium of our times. And there are some very, very good films which do express uh, uh, something of that aesthetic quality mm. so that when you watch them you feel that you're touched very deeply something in you is is uh, called upon uh, mm. without you necessarily um, asking for it or looking for it mm. uh, you know no doubt I spoke again and again about the great Andrei Tarkovsky, who's uh, right, yeah. in my mind the, by far the greatest uh, <laughs> yeah. filmmaker although I saw a very good film recently um, Roma 
uh, by mm. Quaron, who, who made Gravity, but this is a completely different order mm. of film. Uh, and uh, it had the same sort of quality. You're drawn in mm. and you, you find that you're touched very, very deeply, almost beyond the human level. Mm. Uh, something in you responds. Mm. So uh, I, I was no doubt referring to this responsiveness as this uh, spiritual receptivity, if you see what I mean. Mm. Spiritual receptivity is setting aside intellect, setting aside emotion in the ordinary sense, not setting them aside in, so, in, in that you're suppressing them, mm. but that you're not letting them predominate. Mm. In fact, they are unified in the act of responsiveness. Mm. Uh, it's not that your aesthetic responses are unintelligent or unemotional, but they are integrated in this, in this re uh, responsiveness that is of a, of a higher quality to mm. use the metaphor of up and down. Mm. So yes, uh, the, 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 the films give one, uh, it's a common medium that everybody knows. Mm. And it, it's, I think, the, the medium of, of modern times, uh, mm. the, the aesthetic medium of modern times. So that if, if you've watched decent films, uh, you know, I also enjoy just fun films, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a, bit of, a bit of action or a bit of rom-com occasionally uh, is OK. But you don't look to those for spiritual uplift. Mm. Uh, but uh, when you watch a really decent film, the, the great uh, uh, Andrei Tarkovsky, may his name be blessed, uh, mm. um, you, you, you feel you're drawn onto another level. Mm. And uh, so it's, it's a, a very good way of illustrating what the spiritual receptivity is. Mm. Opening yourself up to that which transcends yourself, at least to some extent, in mm. the aesthetic realm. Mm. Yeah. So it's a really wonderful example talking about films. I think it's one that everyone yes. can... can um, yeah. To. I certainly watch films where I feel sort of drawn in and lifted up. Yeah. It's yeah. Stay with me. And yeah. Also, this thing you're talking about of... Doesn't, you weren't quite saying it doesn't quite make sense, but it's like slight, I don't want to call it mystical, but there's a slight sort of magic to it. Or a... Yes, 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 yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Well, I, I remember very clearly that the, the, the first time I saw Solaris, um, mm. uh, the film by Tarkovsky, and I came out of it in an altered state of consciousness, mm. a, a quite definitely altered state of consciousness, which took me by surprise. Mm. Um, because I'd been receptive. Well, Tarkovsky made me receptive. He uses certain uh, filmic methods that make you receptive, mm. that stop you from looking for meaning. Mm. And uh, then you're, you're drawn beyond yourself into, a, into an experience which is very, very deep indeed, mm. almost mm. despite yourself. Mm. You're in one mood when you go in, but mm. you're in another when you come out. The same can be true of looking at paintings or music, Mm. Yeah. yeah and it, i was i often think in this area that um well in the buddhist tradition particularly i don't know in the pali canon in sort of early buddhism there seems to be something of this in um the people living in that time their response to nature there seems to be yes yeah that kind yeah. of draw like this sort of higher meaning in what's yeah. around them like sort of suddenly a tree becomes a spirit and yeah, you know, that kind yeah. Of thing. yeah. well it, the, the buddha lived in an animist universe mm. and animist culture. Very interestingly, quite recently, I, I led a retreat in, in Bodh Gaya and uh, uh, some uh, men came to join the retreat uh, and they were, they were tribal people. Uh, mm. uh, in, in India, this is a particular sort of category. Everybody in India fits into a category, but they're uh, Adivasi, they're, they're people who live in the forests and uh, live a very ancient way of life. So we got talking and they asked me well, I asked them, well, what is your religious background? Are you Hindus? And they said, oh, no, no, we're not Hindus. Uh, and they said, we worship nature. Mm. So mm. they described what was happening. And I said, well, it, this was the world of the Buddha. Mm. The Buddha lived in that world mm. and, and a very attractive. And there was something particular about them, a, a wholeness to them. Mm. I, I experienced it. Um, in fact, I experienced it on my first retreat, um, oh. coming out of meditation. It, almost comical thinking back actually you know, people came from the stressed city and then out of meditation yeah. they came and we all sort of lined up majestically and looked at the sunrise over yes. a tree yeah 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 oh, yeah yeah, really yeah. well you, you know that uh, Bhante uh, again Sangharakshita said that 
a, a universe that is not alive is not a universe within which it's possible to gain enlightenment. Mm. But of course, it's not just the universe is alive, whether we see it as alive or not. Mm. But if you see the, the universe as full of life, it's not just somehow in an abstract sense it's alive, but, well, like you said, the, the tree is alive. Mm. It has a life. It has a consciousness. Mm. It's not like ours. Maybe you need to see Lord of the Rings to think about <laughs> that. But, yeah, the, 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 the universe is filled with life. Mm. And if you don't see that, then you don't, you're not able to gain enlightenment because you don't really see yourself. You don't see what you are. You don't see what the world is. And you're just living in, well, the left side of your brain, according to Mr. Gilchrist. <laughs> mm. Gilchrist. So, uh, yes, it, it is, it's very significant that one opens up to the natural world around one. And that's part of this receptivity mm. at a relatively low level. Mm. Um, but uh, if you don't have the lower levels, you don't have the higher. Mm. So is that, is that a sort of good place to start in terms of, developing this capacity for responsiveness, kind of nature and art and films. Is that, yeah. is that yeah. what you sort of suggest people do? Or? Well, it, 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 uh, th this receptivity is to be experienced in so many different fields, but probably it, it's in, it, for most people, uh, especially living in cities, uh, the best access is through art. Hmm. Uh, and uh, this doesn't mean, you know, uh, uh, kind of willfully taking on art that you really don't appreciate mm. but actually learning to see learning to to open up to and i think something that often happens with people engaging with our movement uh, because people are generally so uncultured often nowadays or belong to a culture that is relatively aesthetically uh, um well uh, 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 deadened and mm. highly conceptualized, conceptual art, for goodness sake. Um, <laughs> so, yes, it's, 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 uh, that sort of aesthetic education is something that happens. And it's an education not, this means that, it's an mm. education in how to experience in spiritual receptivity. Mm. So I think that's a very, very important place for, for most people. Mm. But nature is extremely important. That's why I live in the mm. wilds of Wales, uh, mm. where the, the, the rain... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, it affects me very directly. And uh, I feel the, almost, you might say, the presence of the storm god. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, when, when the sun god pleases to smile upon me, I, uh, I worship him, as it were, yeah, I, yeah. metaphorically. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm very conscious that right, right from where I am, if I look out my window in the day, I can see a, a Bronze Age burial mound on the top of a mountain. Mm. Uh, which, you know, clearly the whole landscape was alive. Mm. And, and so you can feel something of that. So if you have that good fortune to get out into, into nature, so much the better. Even Victoria Park is better than uh, mm. uh, the concrete jungle. Victoria Park will do, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think the other medium within which uh, uh, receptivity is experienced, uh, apart from meditation, very commonly, is in friendship. Ah. So in, in deeper human relations, uh, you, 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 you don't just chatter with each other, but you take each other in, if you see what I mean. Mm. You open to each other. Mm. I remember somebody describing uh, sitting with Bante one day and Bante turned to him and said, I can feel your energy. Mm. And uh, um, he, he was very, very struck by that. Uh, so... That's that's what we do in the communication exercises. I don't know whether they get done anymore. I know we do those still. Yeah, yeah. Oh, when good, you're looking good, into good. someone's eyes for a long time. Yeah. So when you're doing those exercises, uh, for those that don't know, you you sit opposite somebody and you just look at each other. And so what starts to happen if if uh, this goes on for. Uh, if you if you succeed in in as it were overcoming your embarrassment and self consciousness uh, and your desire to look good in the eyes of the other, <laughs> it comes to be a sort of exchange of energy. Mm. Uh, you can even feel this almost quite physically mm. uh, that the energy tr is transmitted from one to the other, mm. uh, and it, it, it sort of circulates between you, mm. and uh, that happens when you access this receptivity, this faculty of receptivity. So I think that, uh, that that's a field within which one commonly experiences, uh, or rather can experience um, uh, 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 receptivity.
Mm. I think you experience it in the ethical field as well. Mm. Um, uh, and in, in a way, our, our training in ethics isn't a, a matter of learning what, what it's right to do and what it's wrong to do, although mm. it may have to start with that. Mm. It's more like learning to feel. Mm. That doesn't feel right. Mm. That feels wrong or mm. that does feel right. That is what I should do. Mm. Of course, there's lots of room for, for rationalization and self, self-deception. But uh, yes, I think that's another field in which one can experience uh, that ethical, uh, that, that uh, spiritual receptivity. You know, when you're in with a group of people and they start talking in a particular way mm. and you just feel, oh, I don't like this. Mm. And it's not a thought. Mm. It's, not a, it's not a judgment in the, in the ordinary sense. It's uh, a definite uh, uh, feeling, mm. intuition. Mm. This is not right. Mm. I shouldn't be engaging with this. Mm. Ideally, you try to change the current of it, but if nothing else, you just withdraw. So, uh, and, and sometimes also one's response to uh, ethical actions or ethical situations uh, comes from that sort of level. You see somebody do something really noble and you feel a really strong response to it. Well, that's your spiritual receptivity. Mm. It, it, it's, um, it, uh, uh, it's referred to it as a faculty. Mm. Uh, it's a special faculty that we have for responding to higher truth uh, mm. and what goes beyond us. Um, yeah, again, you, you can experience that faculty in the context of, of, um, of, of uh, truth, as it were, mm. when you hear something mm. that you feel is right. Mm. And you, uh, you just respond to it. Mm. Mm. God, it was really good. I, I love this idea of responsiveness of just yes. Up. And um, one of the things I was thinking about is yeah, the role of other people in it. But I was also thinking about um, well, I, I, the role of being bored in it. I was thinking of um, when my friends, uh, particularly Vidya Dark and my preceptor and David Mitra, who I live with upstairs. Um, they started taking me to art galleries and playing me classical yeah. music. And at first, you know, I was a sort of 24-year-old man who just sort of thought, what, what's this got to do with anything? This is so yeah. dull. Um, yeah. And then they sort of encouraged me to stay with it. And um, yeah. I know you've talked in a couple of places about the place of boredom in yes. becoming responsive. And even I think, or being uncomfortable, that kind of communication exercise of looking into someone's eyes is, it's not boring, but it's uncomfortable. That kind of... right boredom, uncomfortableness, just yeah. before you start to open up and be responsive. Right. Would yeah. you say something about boredom? And I think somewhere you've said yeah. it's the key to being responsive or yeah. something like that. Yeah. Just before, before we go on to that, I, I wanted to say something about uh, uh, learning to appreciate more uh, oh, yeah. uh, aesthetic, uh, deeply aesthetic um, uh, culture, art. Mm. I, I think that one, one needs a bit more help not just being taken and subjected to uh, 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 things. I'm sure they didn't do this. Yeah, they were very, they were very good to give them. Yeah, they you want. need to actually know a little bit about it. I remember uh, Bante saying that when he first listened to Indian classical music, he couldn't make anything of it. Mm. But a friend of his, an Indian friend of his said, listen to the tabla. Mm. Keep your ear on the tabla. And uh, he said that when he did that, then the whole thing opened up for him. Mm. And I know this with, with, for instance, Baroque music. If you listen to what they call the ground, mm. then uh, everything else that happens on the, on the ground makes sense. So I think that one of the roles of, 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 the, of a, a Kalyana Mitra is uh, uh, aesthetic educator, yeah. uh, where you're being taught how to listen, how to look. And mm. I've been very fortunate in that way to have, have had that sort of aesthetic education, particularly from Bante, actually. Mm. I remember going with him. I'm sorry, I'm not getting to your question yet. Please, no, let's park it, yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get there. But um, uh, I, I went with him to the Musée Cluny in, uh, in Paris, which is the Museum of uh, Medieval Art. Mm. And we went into a room which was full of glass cases with tiny little ivory plaques. And... Um, you know, my heart sank. There were <laughs> yeah. uh, acres and acres of tiny ivory plaques. So we started looking at, at these. I, I was dutifully standing next to Bante, and he just suddenly went sort of, well, look at the way this shape interacts with this shape. 
Mm. Suddenly, mm. The, the plaque came to life and then all the others came to life. So, yes, mm. I advocate the role of the aesthetic educator as a, as a Kalyana Mitrata in that way. In quite a simple way, mm. put your eye there, put your ear there. When you watch this film, look for this. Mm. Mm. Anyway, back to boredom. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe before we move on to boredom, actually, sort of staying, okay. with, staying with this thread, it's got me interested about, that almost includes being responsive to the teacher or to the oh. expert or... Yes, um, yeah. So I'm sort of interested in that. We can come back to boredom, but yes. it's like a good thing to talk about now in terms of, well, the Buddhist tradition seems to talk about being receptive to the wise, receptive yes. to your yeah. teacher. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if you could say something about that dynamic. I mean, I've experienced that. And as I was saying with these people, sure. with me about culture and- Yes, um, yeah, yeah. I guess, I guess, for example, going with Sangrachta with Vante to the medieval- Yeah. Art packs, you almost have to allow yourself to accept that you don't know or that you don't yes. understand or that you're yes. not in need help. And yes. I yeah. sometimes find that quite difficult. Yeah. I think other people do. You've got to let yourself yes. say yeah. you don't know, you don't understand. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that that that's a very very astute, and it re in a way sort of relates to boredom. Uh, it, it's um, the, the not knowing oh. uh, that that is is the the basis for this receptive faculty to open up. Uh, I think in those talks I mentioned uh, the the letter that John Keats, the romantic poet, yeah. wrote to his brother, mm. in which he talked about negative capability. Mm. That for for poetry you need negative capability. Uh, and it's negative in the sense that well, it, well, it, I, I can't remember it exactly now, it's beautifully put, mm -hmm. but something like the ability to uh, live amongst uncertainties with an out, without, uh, uh, without an irritable seeking after certainty. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, I've not got that right, he put it yeah. much better than that. But yes, you, you have to suspend that in you which wants to know, which is a deep instinct, mm. because knowing makes you safe. Mm. Uh, in order not knowing, you feel unsafe, mm. uh, and so you you have to in a, in in a, in that modern phrase make yourself vulnerable. <laughs> in other words, you have to open yourself up to uh, uh, the, the not knowing, uh, mm. and therefore, as it were, being small um, mm. or smaller. So yes, that that's what has to happen in relation to a teacher. Of mm. course, it's complex. Mm. because you have to choose what you make yourself open to mm. and uh, you know myself uh, having related to a, 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 a genius I think a spiritual mm. genius uh, Sangrakshita who as we know had um, a, a number of different sides to his personality some of mm. which we might not find so acceptable mm. so how do you work out what to open yourself to and how do you not Mm. And uh, I think the key is to at least have the confidence that your teachers, your Kalyanamitras, have got something to say. Mm. Uh, to take what uh, Bante himself put it, he, he doesn't expect his disciples to, be to believe what he says, but he expects them to take him seriously. Mm. So your, your duty as a, as a disciple is to take your Kalyanamitras seriously, mm. even if you know, you don't understand and you want to ask questions, you're not quite sure, maybe you even feel that's not right, but you take them seriously. And mm. uh, you, you reckon that even if they've not got it quite right, it's for, uh, as it were, it, it's, um, it's not for, for the kind of reasons that you might ascribe to it. There's something more to it than that. Mm. So yes, you, you do need to have that sense that, uh, you know, you're, you're not full up, you don't know everything and that you're willing to learn. Mm. And then you have to sort of work out in that relationship um, what you have to be open to and what you don't, mm. uh, which is fascinating. It can be quite it to learn, can't it? I think oh, yeah. some Buddhist traditions I know are a bit more, um, they have a teacher uh, that at least in a context like a Buddhist centre sits yeah. away, they're a kind yeah. of guru or they represent that. Whereas in our movement, in the Tri Ratna yeah. movement, this even this word you're using Kalyana Mitra we have this spiritual yes. friendship and it's it's too well, well for example I live in a community with people I look up to and yeah. so you do have to kind of learn um yeah when what to be responsive to and what yeah. to take seriously yeah yes yes yeah and you get it wrong you get it wrong mm. in both directions sometimes 
being over receptive, which is not really receptivity. Mm. It's um, it's uh, sort of um, uh, well, just suspending your your sense of individuality, mm. uh, and and uh, yes, yeah, sometimes you 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 don't listen properly. So mm. yeah, you, you it, but it takes time to work that out, as mm. it does generally. That the faculty of receptivity, uh, initially until it's it's really mature, is slightly problematic. Can be problematic, because it's difficult to tell whether you're being receptive. Or merely, you know, you like it, as it were, uh, for for thoroughly uh, egoistic reasons. Mm. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you've got to tease out what is a genuine response of receptivity from what is merely attraction mm. or, uh, uh, um, or craving or even mm. lust um, mm. uh, and so on. Or what, what from repulsion. You may be repelled from something that actually... Uh, uh, requires your receptivity. So because we're not integrated and not sufficiently positively, positively emotional, then we, uh, we don't find uh, it easy to be clearly receptive and mm. we'll get it wrong mm. uh, again and again, but that's okay. Mm. Something that's to learn. Process. Yeah, yeah. Mm. We'll, we'll have a break in a minute, uh, Sabuti, but okay. just, just before we do, I thought, shall we return quickly to the, this um, concept of boredom? Okay, yes. And, um, yeah, being bored, and particularly in this yeah. talk that you were giving that I was uh, listening to yes. earlier today, I'm like, boredom seems to be a key part of learning how to stay with boredom. Yes. How to learn how to be receptive yeah. to yeah. transcendental, yeah. to, yeah. to um, yeah. uh, Would you say yeah. something about boredom? Yes, well, I, I think that we, we particularly in the modern world, tend to keep ourselves occupied. Mm. Uh, and of course, the Internet is the, the most efficient deliverer of distraction and of, of mental occupation there's ever been. Mm. Uh, human beings have evolved a way of keeping themselves permanently uh, engaged with something. Mm. You know, the famous situation you get on the tube. Do you remember? I, I remember the tube. Uh, you probably don't remember these days. Really. I remember the days <laughs> when there were none of these things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you get on the tube and people just there. Mm. And uh, there's a great deal more mutual awareness. And mm. uh, you could see people's moods and so forth. Whereas now that just s almost everybody sunk in, in distraction. Mm. Uh, and uh, so they definitely don't get space. They don't get a, an opening. Mm. Uh, and of course, the more you do not give yourself that opening, the more reluctant you are to give yourself it. Mm. So when you do give it, you feel very uncomfortable. Mm. Uh, you feel dead. You may even feel uh, humbled, mm. uh, humiliated even, because mm. what are you without something to engage with? Mm. And, and you may you, you, you could put all of that under the general heading of, of boredom, itchy mm. feet, restless, want <laughs> something, uh, uh, turn on. What can I find? Look at the news mm. again. <laughs> um, go to YouTube and just look at everything that's there. Mm. My goodness, you can tell how dated I am. I'm sure there are lots of other things that you can do. Uh, that's but, a stupid good <laughs> mess. Yeah, that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, anything rather than just being with nothing mm. and it's only when you're with nothing that something from a deeper level can emerge mm. so again i got this teaching like everything from from sangraksta he was he's saying you know boredom is extremely important mm. uh, uh, boredom is the sign that you're not engaged with what's presently going on mm. but if you wait then engagement will come from another level Mm. And this takes us very deep indeed. Ultimately, it takes us to uh, uh, to reality itself. Mm. Um, but, but maybe that's a, 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 a story for after the break, where everybody mm. can have five minutes of boredom. But yeah. yes, uh, yeah, boredom yeah. is 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 what happens when you allow a space mm. with nothing to do. Uh, mm. or, or, of course, it can happen when there are things that you're supposed to be doing that you don't want to do, that you're not mm. engaged with. It's lack of engagement, mm. lack of interest. Mm. Uh, 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 but rather than then fill that interest up with uh, that lack of interest up with something that engages you to some extent, or at least some level of you, uh, stay with it. Mm. And uh, uh, I, I, I can guarantee that if you stay with it for long enough, 
and if you accustom yourself to doing so, you will find that creative energies come from a deeper level mm -hmm. and that you'll feel yourself connecting with something further. Mm -hmm. As silence, solitude, uh, uh, space, so important mm -hmm. uh, for, well, especially for developing the spiritual receptivity. Mm. Oh, interesting. Okay, let, let's have a break, Sabuti. Um, okay. I think maybe we will come back to some of that after it. Okay. Um, and in, in the break, uh, for people at home, do um, type questions into the chat box on YouTube. After the break, I'll carry on talking to Sabuti in the way that we have for about 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll start weaving in those questions. So do, do type them in now. Um, so yeah, thank you very much so far, Sabuti. Uh, uh, and thank let's you. have a five minute, a five minute break. So back here at uh, eight fifty five. Great.
Okay, good. So I think we're back. Okay. We almost had a technical issue here, but I think uh, the tech team resolved it. Uh, yeah, that's great, like that yeah, for me. Um, good. Okay, so yeah, welcome back, Zabuti. Um, uh, well, I'm really enjoying talking to you about this. It's um, I'm finding it quite exciting, actually. Um, quite sort of uh, quite sort of inspiring. Uh, um, so yeah, I feel very sort of alive to it all. Um, so let me just briefly look at where I thought we'd go next. Um, so I thought I'd come back to um, this thing. Well, particularly one of the things that made me think about it was the exercise that we do on retreat sometimes of uh, looking into somebody's eyes. Um, and that made me think of sort of gazing into somebody's eyes. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sort of used to that being a lover, um, basically. That's where I'm used to that happening. Mm -hmm. And that got me thinking about eros and the erotic and Mm -hmm. That often gets mentioned in this spiritual receptivity uh, area. That but often, often gets what, seem, sorry, that up, guess, uh, often, often gets mentioned in this kind of right. section of these aspects. Right. Um, but not so much meaning gazing into the eyes of a lover. Um, no. I wonder if you could say something about um, eros and eros and that energy and that sort of mm. attraction. Um, mm. Just something brief about that because I think it's a it's another way of talking about this area. I think at least. Right. Well, quite interestingly, the uh, the the, the Neoplatonists um, mm -hmm. uh, in the in the Renaissance, for those that are familiar with that sort of material, it, it's very much represented in Botticelli's paintings. Mm. Uh, they saw uh, eros as the force that sort of drove the 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 the, the, the spiritual life, uh, mm. uh, what we would call the spiritual life, and uh, so. Uh, you know, it clearly does relate to what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So that we're talking about boredom and uh, opening up, uh, allowing a space. And uh, what you begin to experience when you allow, allow that space is a sort of energy which connects. Mm -hmm. huh? Something mm -hmm. arises within you that connects, uh, connects with something a little bit more than you. So that, for instance, in uh, you know the the the, the model of uh, looking at a film that we talked of earlier, mm -hmm. um, you find something in you that you weren't necessarily in contact with before is suddenly called upon, and the response to the uh, uh, the underlying aesthetic message or the mm. aesthetic life of the film, perhaps better than message, the life of the film, or the life that the film. Uh, communicates mm. so that uh, <clears throat> within oneself there is the capacity for responsiveness uh, and uh, that uh, is another way of talking about uh, receptivity mm. it's 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 one's c capacity for responsiveness to that which transcends oneself mm. Mm. Uh, so and and you could call that eros mm. uh, as as long as you understand that in the strict sense, uh, rather than in the sense of uh, the erotic, in the narrow sense of the mm -hmm. sexual uh, mm -hmm. or, or the sexo romantic. Although the sexo romantic is, of course, a sort of uh, uh, prefiguration of that. Mm. Uh, it, the, the, it's often, for instance, when you first fall in love, it's, um, it's your first encounter with that energy within you, often. Mm. Unfortunately, it just. Uh, um, however beautiful he or she may be, uh, it uh, it falls upon an object that is not capable of sustaining it sufficiently. Mm. If you see what I mean, it it, it mm. uh, goes beyond. And, and since we're on the Neoplatonic theme, of course, this is got back to Plato and mm. the Symposium, uh, mm. where he talks about this sort of ascent of love, mm. uh, the responsiveness which. Uh, initially is directed towards another person, but then becomes for their qualities and then for those qualities, as it were, independent of them mm. and uh, are then for uh, the, the highest uh, possible good. Mm. So uh, the, 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 the energy that uh, is res responsiveness is present in our ordinary lives. It's just it's short circuited. Mm. It's, uh, it's drawn off into uh, uh, channels that are uh, not going to take it much further. Mm. They may do through the vicissitudes of fortune, but uh, in the ordinary way, they will not. They will not uh, uh, transcend themselves. Mm. But um, you know, the trick 
is to keep that energy flowing uh, towards higher and higher objects, uh, mm. which is partly a matter of, uh, of um, conscious exercise and partly just simply a matter of allowing oneself to respond. Mm. At, at that, it's really interesting, this area of what you seem to be saying is there is responsiveness. That's part of life. Everyone has yeah. this responsiveness, yeah. but it, it gets used up in lots of different ways. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Without responsiveness, no life. Right. Life yeah. Is that responsiveness, you could say. Ah. Yeah. And then I think that's probably why in some places you, uh, instead of calling it spiritual receptivity, you called it dharmic responsiveness. And I've yes. heard other people say that as well. And yeah. I wonder if you could say something about the dharmic bit of it. So how do you then, what would it, I don't quite know what the question is, something about responsiveness, yeah. but that's dharmic. How do you sort of move it in that direction or what? What is that like? What, what's the dharmic bit of the dharmic responsiveness? Right. Well, the, the dharma clearly here is not teaching, but it is the the uh, the ultimate reality of things, the mm. way things truly are. And it's interesting that that yesterday in in the uh, in the discussion, uh, one of the questioners uh, um, spoke of realizing in metta bhavna that. Uh, Meta is reality, mm. um, which mm. I, th I thought was a, a very uh, important intuition. Mm. So, uh, it, 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 you're, when you're responding to the Dhamma, you're responding in, in the Dhamma in this sense, you're responding to reality itself. Mm. Reality is supremely attractive, reality as uh, a, a, a totally fulfilling uh, and a, a completing. Um, so it, it the, 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 the spiritual research, spiritual respond, responsiveness uh, begins with a fairly ordinary responsiveness to just good, the good, to friends, uh, to, uh, you know, quite a nice, a, a, a little bit of aesthetic um, elevation, as it were, mm -hmm. in a fairly ordinary sense, you know, uh, a good riff by Jimi Hendrix or something like that, uh, uh, if I may date myself, but, um, you know, something that, uh, yes, yeah, in some ways, it's just a, a bit of sort of raunchy blues, but there's something that uh, the great Jimmy did bring out. Um, I touched him once, by the way, but anyway, we won't go on there. Uh, uh, you, you know, that was, was of, a, of, a, of, a, of a definitely higher aesthetic quality. Um, so, you know, the responsiveness begins at a fairly ordinary level, but it then goes to some to, to, to objects that are of a, a definitely qualitatively higher kind and that are less and less sensu sensuously oriented. Hmm. Uh, and uh, it then, of course, in meditation, it goes towards uh, the objects of meditation, especially if you're doing hmm. uh, meditation, uh, visualizing Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, uh, you, you, you're responding to them. Mm. And uh, then you respond to the uh, the Dharma that they embody. Mm. So uh, th this is a, a very important principle. Uh, it it it's um, particularly exemplified in the Western tradition by uh, by Platonism and Neoplatonism. Uh, this this hierarchy of responsiveness. Mm. But I think it it very much applies within within the Dharma. Mm. That uh, you you know you you start by responding to relative elevation. Uh, relative to what you have now, but mm. that becomes more and more exalted, uh, mm. and uh, it ultimately it it connects with the energy of reality. Mm. Put it like that. I'm talking of it as an energy, just to get away from the idea of it as a, a sort of neutral a kind of um, uh, impersonal blank. Yeah. Mm. Uh, well, even of course, uh, Buddhist tradition then uh, personifies um, the reality. So. Behind your right shoulder, you have the Buddha Amitabha, uh, who is uh, the personification of reality, uh, because reality is more like a person than it mm. than, a, than, a, than a principle. Mm. So there's a responsiveness that takes you uh, all that way, and, it, and and as soon as you begin to connect with uh, mm. the, uh, the 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 the, uh, the the nature of things, then that responsiveness becomes a dharmic responsiveness. Mm. But it, it's, it's gradate, it's graded, it, it's um, hierarchical, it mm. elevates uh, as it uh, it um, 
it refines, it's capable of receiving more, uh, uh, responding to more subtle objects. Mm. Ultimately, uh, the, the highest and most subtle, if that's the right word, yeah. object of all. Mm. Yeah. I, I wonder if, um, just before I ask you some questions from the people watching, um, whether you just say something about the just sitting meditation practice. I know you oh. were taking people through that this morning. I couldn't make it this morning. I wonder if you could, just before I take some questions from people watching, you yeah. could say something about the place of the just sitting practice yeah. in this stage and what is that practice? Just yeah. some sort of yeah. brief, yeah. yeah. I'll find out your excuse for not being there this morning later. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you later. It's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all the other practices are, are active. So mm. mindfulness of breathing, you're actively trying to pay attention to the breath. Uh, um, uh, Metta you're actively directing your metta towards particular objects. Spiritual death, we'll see, you're actively reflecting. Uh, and in a, a, a spiritual rebirth, you're actively connecting with images that um, embody reality. Mm -hmm. But uh, the danger is that you then m put all your attention, put, make all your effort, or sorry, put all your ideas about spiritual life onto effort. Mm. And curiously, effort uh, in spiritual life negates itself because uh, the effort entails will and will entails I. It entails self. So when you when you make an effort, uh, you are, in some senses, strengthening yourself, mm. uh, your, your self idea, your self clinging even. Uh, and, you know, and you have a good session of 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 uh, meta of. Um, uh, mindfulness of breathing and you're able to focus all the time and you feel rather pleased with yourself mm. uh, uh, it's because you've been able to will yourself to do so mm. but um that the that sh that's not the way you should be meditating uh, and the uh, just sitting practice helps us to counteract that willful approach to mm. uh, to spiritual pra to, to spiritual life and spiritual practice so, uh, well, Bhante says that, you, you know, you do the Anapanasati, then just sitting. Mm. You do my Metta Bhavna, then you do just sitting and so on. Mm. So it's the balancing practice. Mm. So, for instance, with the, the, the practices that we've been doing at the end of the, the, the mindfulness of breathing, I'll say now stop making an effort and just experience the effects of the practice. Mm. So in effect, you're doing just sitting. You're mm. being receptive to what's arising from the practice. Mm. And so often I find in the, in, particularly with the Metta Bhavna, it's when I stop making an effort and just open up to Metta that mm. it transcends itself. Mm. And one begins to experience Metta as not mine, but as something operating through me. Mm. So the, 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 the function of just sitting is to, as is a corrective, it can become a whole um, a path in itself. Uh, it's possible to gain enlightenment simply by doing just sitting. I, I don't speak from personal experience, unfortunately, mm. but, uh, uh, you, you know, I can get a flavor of it that through just uh, uh, just being there, just opening up, staying present and staying uh, uh, attentive to what's mm. going on, uh, you, you, you find something beginning to emerge from deeper within you. Mm. You find your mind expanding so that it becomes free, as it were, from uh, all the contents of your experience. Mind mm. is bigger than experience, you could say. Mm. And uh, you, you begin to uh, uh, relax into that. Uh, and... Uh, you could say that at this point you're you're in the outer suburbs of enlightenment, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, if you if you just persist uh, in uh, staying at attentive, staying aware, staying alert, uh, and uh, we're looking with um, um, an alert eye, not not a thinking eye, mm. but an alert eye uh, at, to uh, to your experience, you'll find it begins to change its character. Mm. and uh, uh, it begin, begins to open up mm. and uh, you may find that you're, you're, as I say, sort of moving into the area of, of insight, but not by any reflection or any teaching or anything like that, but simply by 
uh, allowing yourself to stay in, uh, the, in, in, in the present without making an effort. As Bante used to say, without, don't make an effort and don't not make an effort, mm. <laughs> which was uh, infuriatingly uh, uh, um, imprecise, but actually extremely helpful. Mm. Mm. It's one of those things, I think, that, um, you know, don't make an effort, don't try and not make an effort. That, that yeah. I think, was well, just looking at the questions, some of them are in that area of, okay, yeah. but, but what do you mean? Or, you know, yeah, sort yeah, of, yeah. I think yeah. one disclaimer to say is, I think that's one of the reasons why Sanger actually would say that is it's yes. more about pausing and not trying to even quite understand. Yes, yes. yeah, yeah. In, in fact, uh, he was quite, some people wanted to give more content mm. uh, to just sitting. And I suppose it's fair enough to talk about it, but he was quite resistant to that mm. uh, and, and, and said that that begins to deny what it actually is mm. because you're bringing thoughts into it, ideas into it. Whereas in a way you, you, uh, yeah, I used to take it like a koan, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the Chinese and Japanese kongan in Chinese, ja koan in Japanese, this sort of conundrum, you know, mm -hmm. does a dog have Buddha nature, which you <laughs> wrestle with. So for me, the, 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 the big question was, how do you uh, uh, not make an effort without trying not to make an effort? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, of course, you know, after a while, you begin to get it. Mm -hmm. You begin to get it. Uh, and and it's basically sort of more like relaxation. Mm. You relax, but mm -hmm. uh, it's not just relax and go to sleep or relax and um, let your mind wander. You mm. relax whilst remaining absolutely present. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, Stephen is our uh, Simon. Sorry, is asking about um, what well, different hindrances. So Simon's talking about oh, if he was to just sit and do nothing, he'd experience anxiety. And oh. uh, Stefan, uh, Stefan. Uh, has said he'd just be sort of distracted. Um, right. So what's the sort of effort you make or do you just let the distractions play out or do you move away from them or um, right. yes. what, what if you're anxious, do you sort of just embrace it or what's the yeah. sort of relationship yeah. to what comes yeah. up? Yeah. yeah. Well, I think one would have to, to deal with, with uh, individuals. One couldn't generalise. Mm. Uh, obviously, it's really only possible to do just sitting to any effect if you've got a, a certain degree of integration mm. and a certain degree of positive emotion. So the, the indication may be that you, you need to do much more work on uh, integration and positive emotion. Mm. Uh, that uh, if, if you're not sufficiently integrated, then you'll just drift. Mm. If you're not sufficiently positive emotionally, then you will uh, fall into negative emotions, mm. particularly if you've got habitual negative emotions. Mm. But if you, if uh, the anxiety is, um, how can I say, um, reasonably um, contained, it, uh, then it may be that you just sit with the anxiety. Mm. Uh, not in the sense of just sitting being anxious, but uh, that you, you try to uh, uh, be bigger than the anxiety. Mm. Um, uh, mm. You know, I remember a, a, a Japanese saying, a Zen saying, that if you want to control a cow, give it a big field. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, um, you know, we think of controlling the cow yeah. by tethering it. Um, uh, you know, to, to uh, a, a post or whatever. That's the traditional metaphor for uh, developing uh, anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing. But mm. the, 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 this method is more, you just give it a huge field. Mm. So the cow wanders around, but um, it can never escape the field. Mm. The field is bigger. Mm. Uh, it can never wander far enough. So mm. that means that you need to have a big enough field to not just get caught out. I and mean, if, you, if your anxiety is habitual and uh, you, know, you try to do this, you try to give it a big field, well, you may just find yourself being rushed around by anxiety. The mm. cow may dominate you. Um, so it, it's horses for courses to continue the animal <laughs> metaphor. So uh, uh, I think probably everybody needs to put more effort into integration and mm. positive emotion. And that's not just a question of meditation. Mm. It's also a question of one's, well, it, it is a question of one's whole life. 
mm. uh, making sure that one's whole life is uh, integrated and integrating mm. and uh, that one is working out one's uh, own little uh, um, corners of emotional negativity, uh, uh, it, which especially happens through friendship. Mm. Um, I think more than anything, coming mm. into a positive community. We talked about this yesterday, mm. and the loss of positive community in our modern mm. um, alienated world. So I, I think that you need to be working very much on those two areas mm. and be a little cautious with, uh, my, uh, with just sitting. Don't do it for too long. If you do it for, for a long time, you're just drifting or mm. you're just anxious, uh, you may uh, then um, uh, just habituate yourself to that. Mm. So I think probably better to do quite short periods. Bunte mm. used to recommend 20 minutes mm. uh, until you really are able to stay with it. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I, I'd say sort of stay with the just sitting mm. as long as it lasts, as long as you're able to be present. Mm. And if that's five minutes, great. If it's two minutes, that's pretty good. Pretty good two yeah. minutes can become three. <laughs> three minutes can become four. And after some time, you'll be able to sit for hours, mm. just present. Mm. So, uh, you know, it, uh, um, uh, it, it's not a practice. It, it, it's, and if you're not doing it, you're not doing it, mm. if you see what I mean. So yeah. uh, don't, don't try to do it for too long. Mm. Mm. I'm really pleased that you brought back in the um, the other stages, the other essential oh, yeah. yeah. uh, integration and positive. Just by the the way that we conduct these interviews, they sort of yeah. might feel like they become their own <laughs> world. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yeah. even some of the questions about how do yeah. you work with anxiety? How do you work with? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, but it's very interesting, isn't it? Because the, the the one about anxiety, of course, relates to positive emotion, mm. and the one about uh, getting lost in in distraction that relates to integration. Mm. So then you can see why uh, the stage of uh, spiritual receptivity in the, the system of practice mm. is, uh, is based upon uh, integration of positive emotion. Mm. Um, Kevin has a question about, um, uh, he's asking, is there a moral dimension to receptivity? Oh. He's, that he known, he's known oh. some very refined aesthetic people who weren't very nice. Um, yes, there's a yes. sort of moral dimension to this yes, aesthetic yeah. appreciation. Um, yes, yeah. yes. Well, it, it, of course, aesthetic appreciation I only used as a metaphor or rather as an aspect of it. And mm. I did mention that uh, this uh, um, uh, spiritual receptivity or spiritual responsiveness uh, is also a responsiveness to the moral, mm. uh, to the good. If you like, it's the good, the true, and the beautiful, in the mm. classical uh, sense. So yes, it, 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 one would expect that um, that spiritual faculty of of, uh, of responsiveness to play out in a moral way. Mm. And yes, I think there is a phenomenon uh, of um, uh, aesthetic, um, a, a one-sidedness. Mm. Uh, I remember uh, a, a, a Zen. Uh, a teacher, a, a, an American Zen teacher, uh, Philip Capro Roshi, who was um, uh, at the Nuremberg uh, trials uh, after the war. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he was a lawyer, I can't remember. But um, he was very struck by the fact that th th many of these concentration camp uh, commandants and so forth had very strong aesthetic interests. Mm. Uh, you know, particularly in, in German music, of course, uh, they'd like, they listened to their, their Beethoven and, and so on, uh, their Mozart, uh, and they loved it. They clearly loved it, but mm. it wasn't enough because mm. there was no moral sense. Mm. So th there's a peculiar sense, especially with the, with the aesthetic faculty, that it can become a sort of split off mm. uh, over refinement. So I think this is what the questioner is referring to, and one would expect in the in the in the in the domic context that the the, the responsiveness was responsiveness to uh, uh, to the higher to quality uh, to, mm. to to virtue you could say uh, you know virtue uh, is, uh, um, uh, virtue philosophy is an important uh, branch of things that responsiveness to virtue. Is, um, is, is not selective. Mm. You, you respond to virtue wherever it is, whatever it is. 
Mm. Mm. And if that's not happening, then there's something wrong. Mm. And probably what's happening is some form of bypass so mm. that the aesthetic responsiveness has become appropriated by uh, uh, by some other, un, uh, you know, un, un, uh, uh, energy, some complex within one. In mm. the case of concentration camp guards, presumably something to do with uh, e e egotistical uh, um, uh, assertion and so on. Mm. Dare not, when dare not speculate. Mm. Yeah. It links yeah. back, doesn't it, to what you were saying about um, a beautiful sunset, a Mozart symphony um, being the sort of starting point, a sort of uh, echo of reality or something. Then you take further yes. and yeah. Yeah. start it, and yeah. then yeah. Well, I wouldn't put it. I wouldn't start with a, a Mozart symphony. I'd start with a Jimi Hendrix riff. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I don't. I think sometimes people place it too high. Mm. And uh, even in, in relatively popular music, there can be some aesthetically uh, um, very pleasing passages. Mm. Uh, and uh, so I, I think let's not be too snobbish and snooty about it. Uh, mm. But yes, it, 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 uh, there is there's, um, uh, equality and quality. Mm. So sort of this idea of going with what moves you, what you enjoy yes. yeah. and building on that. Yeah, and, 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 and extending it. Mm. And, uh, you know, push your boundaries mm. uh, and, and uh, uh, go further. Mm. Mm. Um, one, one final question, and then there's a kind of bonus question after that. Um, Robert asks, um, he's asking whether spiritual receptivity can be cultivated in your mundane, everyday life by being more open hearted. I guess what he's getting at is, is there a kind of approach that you can take to your day while you're at work or while yeah. you're cooking dinner that... Yeah. cultivates this responsiveness is there something yes yeah, yeah you can add to your everyday life yes yes we're, we're, we're clearly in your interaction with other people uh, mm. uh, that that responsiveness is especially called upon um but that, that you're trying to connect with with the 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 energy that they are mm. and, and to open yourself to it and where others are also responsive to join with them in, in mutual responsiveness, which becomes friendship. Mm. When there's a mutual responsiveness, then, th th then there's friendship. Mm. So, uh, yes, in all the dealings of your life, trying to bring that responsiveness into play, letting mm. it being a part mm. of your, of your, of your uh, interaction. And, uh, you know, if you're cooking, well, clearly you're both connecting with those you're cooking for. Uh, mm. assuming you're not just cooking for yourself but well you also need connection uh, mm. uh, and uh, but also with the the aesthetic qualities of uh, the the food the 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 the, the colors the tastes and uh, uh, the shapes of uh, the food and so forth the way it's presented so trying to bring an, a, a degree of elegance to everything you do uh not as a a, a kind of um, formulaic exercise, but as a definite responsiveness, mm. trying to learn to see, mm. yeah. Mm. So and, and being uh, also being responsive to your own uh, uh, inner experience, mm. uh, noticing what you uh, what moves you, what touches mm. you, what uh, what pains you. Mm. Uh, and trying to dis disentangle what is merely personality in that and what is genuine responsiveness. Mm. No, the, 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 the spirit, the, all these five aspects should be present, could be present rather, in everything that you do. Mm. Uh, yeah, really, it's a really wonderfully practical thing. Yeah. It sounds like something that can be alive in your life, not a sort yeah. of idea yeah. or a spiritual practice yeah. in the morning I, I think that if, if a common experience that people have i know it can be for me too is of uh, sort of just going through your day doing this doing that doing the next thing and at the end of the day feeling a little bit empty mm. and then often being unwilling to go to sleep because you haven't had a satisfying experience yeah. and uh, searching the internet more and more desperately mm. and that takes you into some dangerous territory um so uh you, you, if, if that, that's a sort of sign that you're not engaged mm. and uh, of course there are levels of engagement but it all connects up with this responsiveness there's mm. there's you're, there's not enough that you are responding to mm. uh in your day 
so mm. your day is is a constant quest for uh, basically sensuous satisfaction or ego satisfaction mm. uh, rather than of, of real fulfillment mm. Mm. Ah, that's a that's a really good place to end uh Sabuti. Um, however, uh, there's lots of people asking if you could suggest some films. <laughs> so that's the, that's the sort of good ending point. But also there's lots of people asking if you would be up for mentioning a few films. Could you say a few films you'd recommend? Right. Well, I'd immediately recommend, I'm just rather at random, I'd immediately recommend this film Roma uh, mm. by Cuaron, um, which I thought was outstanding. Um, a Mexican filmmaker. Mm. Um, a really, really extraordinary film. Uh, and then, of, of course, the, the works of the great Tarkovsky. Um, uh, oh, gosh, there's so many good films. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll have to do uh, Sabuti's favourites. Uh, I think you'll be very interested, yeah. Uh, Kieslowski, um, uh, particularly the, the Three Colours trilogy. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some extraordinary films. I, I've mm. seen uh, quite a few really good ones recently. Mm. Uh, even some of the more Hollywood type films, you know, I wouldn't say they're great films, but they're, they're, they're good. They do communicate something of, of, of real aesthetic quality. Mm. Um, uh, the, you know, the two popes I saw recently, I thought that was uh, a, a really quite brilliant piece of filmmaking. Mm. Yeah. Mm. But uh, yeah, let me just leave you with Roma and then go back to Tarkovsky. Uh, mm. it, it, start with Solaris. That's the easiest to watch. Mm. And uh, The Stalker. Uh, that that they 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 you have to get into a receptive mood. You do. If you yeah. don't get into a receptive mood, you are going to be very bored. <laughs> <laughs> I've had both experiences of Tarkovsky, the yeah, bored yeah. and then the uh, yeah, yeah. really having yeah. Right. yeah. But yeah. Uh, yes, uh, maybe I, it, it, I I've been uh, I over the last ten years or so I've been watching a lot of films and. Uh, um, you know, some enjoyable ones. I can tell you some quite enjoyable rom-coms, but um, uh, uh, the, there's some really, really good films that, that, mm. that change, your, change your life. Mm. Ida? Mm, Ida? Yeah. I'm not sure which, how you pronounce it. Yes, just mm. came to mind. Mm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. That's quite, that's quite a good list already. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure if you created a blog or something, people would be interested. <laughs> not that you have the time, I imagine. Yeah, but we David, should... David Mitra knows he, he and I swap our. our yeah, time. he's quite good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we swap our, our findings. Yeah. Mm. Um, but really, we should wrap up now. And okay. well, it's been as I've been saying, it's been so enjoyable to yeah. sit here with you, Sabuti. Um, yeah. I've got quite connected to you actually over this. Um... You sound very surprised. Why not? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, just because you're not in the room, you're somewhere else. Yeah, but... yeah, yeah. Really enjoyed having a conversation with you. Yeah. Well, like me too. I very much enjoyed. Yeah. I hope everyone else has enjoyed it as well. There's lots of really positive responses oh, uh, good. in the comments. I won't read them out, but people are really appreciative. Oh, good. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm really appreciative of you, Sabuti, and um, good. all the all the work you do. Um, <laughs> even just you're so involved in the life of the London Buddha Centre, um, yeah. and as it were, that's a sort of you know only one small part of your. Um, voluntary, as it were, um, responsibilities. And um, hmm. I once was involved very uh, on the edge of looking at your diary when you were doing a visit here, and it was very, very full. Um, and you're, you're a busy man, and um, yeah. you have such a positive effect in this movement, and uh, I think in the world. Um, so um, this week, we particularly are asking people to uh, make a donation um, to Sabuti rather than to the London Buddhist Centre. So um, the uh, tech team can put that in the link um, and you'll find on the uh, website a way to do that. Um, but it's a really good opportunity for us to support Sabuti. Um, I, I'm really keen that we do that. Sabuti supports so many people, so many projects uh, across basically the whole world. Um, so yeah, it's a chance to um, support him. Uh, so do 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 that. And do um, keep attending these sessions with Sabuti. Yeah, you can join him tomorrow on Zoom. Again, go to the London Buddhist Centre website. Uh, and I think what you're doing, Sabuti, is tomorrow is spiritual death. Um, and that will be the case in the morning on Zoom. And also you'll be being interviewed by Jana Varcher in the evening. Uh, and then on Friday, uh, spiritual rebirth. So do keep coming along. Um, and, uh, well, it, I thought we'd end um, with the transference of merit and uh, self-surrender. Um, so maybe um
um, yeah, you mute yourself, Sabuti. And then together we can, um, I in call and response, you can join me in the transference of merit and self-surrender, a chance to just um, give up uh, anything we've gained from the this evening to the world. Uh, it's a very simple, uh, beautiful verse. So you can just repeat it after me. May the merit gain. May the merit gain. In my acting thus. In my acting thus. Go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. Go to the alleviation of the suffering of all beings. My personality throughout my existences. My personality throughout my existences. My possessions. My possessions. And my merit in all three ways. And my merit in all three ways. I give up without regard to myself. I give up without regard to myself. For the benefit of all beings. For the benefit of all beings. Just as the earth and other elements. Just as the earth and other elements. Are serviceable in many ways. Are serviceable in many ways. To the infinite number of beings. To the infinite number of beings. Inhabiting limitless space. Inhabiting limitless space. So may I become. So may I become that which maintains all beings. That which maintains all beings. Situated throughout space. Situated throughout space. So long as all have not attained. So long as all have not attained. To peace. To peace. Good. Well, thank you very much again, Sabuti, and uh, do keep coming along uh, and joining in with Sabuti's presidential visit um, online, on Zoom and on YouTube. And uh, do use the donation button uh, to donate to Sabuti too. Thank you very much.